Got a few minutes to hear the latest on solving a huge scientific mystery? It's one you'll recognize when you stop to think about it, which most of us never do. It comes down to this. What is trying? I know, you're very familiar with trying. You're always trying to do something. People try to get what they need, but then so do even the simplest organisms. Bacteria, like all living beings, try to keep on living. And non-living things don't try to do anything. Big difference. The most obvious difference between being and not being alive. Yet scientists haven't been able to specify what accounts for the difference. What is it about the living that makes us capable of trying when inanimate things don't try to do anything? To try is to work towards some goal, though not necessarily a goal one has in mind. A lot of our trying happens without awareness. Bacteria don't have feelings or minds, and yet they're trying to stay alive and reproduce. Do you know or feel everything your body does to keep you alive? Of course not. If you're like me, you've got organs you can't even feel or name that are working away trying to keep you going. The living try to keep living. We resist non-existence. By contrast, non-living things put up no resistance to non-existence. There's no fight in them, no struggle for existence. If they're durable, they'll last a while, but they're not trying to last. The living have to keep trying to last because if there's one thing we know about the universe, it's that things don't last. Things fall apart. Organization gets disorganized. Energy peters out. Things as orderly as our bodies degenerate. It's like everything in the universe is on a down escalator towards non-existence. But the living are scrambling up fast enough to stay on it. Everything degenerates, but the living try to self-regenerate, to outpace the universal tendency for things to degenerate. Self-regeneration boils down to three kinds of work that the living do on their own behalf, trying to stay alive. Self-protection, work to regenerate a protective containment, for example, skin or shells to prevent degeneration. Self-repair, work to fix what degenerates. Self-reproduction, work to pass on to offspring their regenerative ability. We all die, but before we do, enough of us reproduce our self-regenerative capacity in offspring that life's trying has continued for billions of years despite its fragility. Non-living things as fragile as bacteria wouldn't last a day. When bacteria die, their bodies degenerate in no time. All life long, bacteria, like the rest of us, are trying to self-regenerate. Bacteria work to rebuild their cell membrane to protect against damage. They try to repair what damage occurs, and they reproduce, passing on their self-regenerative capacity to offspring. So that's one question. Scientifically, what accounts for the trying we see in us living beings, but not in non-living things? The other question is how self-regeneration, the most universal and fundamental trying ever, got started. It's basically the origins of life question, though oddly, most origins of life researchers don't regard trying as a distinguishing feature of life. For example, the dominant theory today is that life started when RNA began replicating. Well, RNA is a chemical, and chemicals aren't trying to do anything, even when they're replicating through chemical reaction. Of course, in life today, RNA or DNA aren't just any chemicals. Scientists often describe them as instructions for building bodies. But think about it. We use instructions when we're trying to achieve something, but the instructions aren't trying to achieve anything. A sterile planet brimming with replicating RNA molecules, whether you call them chemicals or instructions, would still have no living beings on it trying to do anything. Well, okay, then maybe living and trying start with evolution. People sometimes imagine evolution as some new force that pops into the universe getting life going, or they think of natural selection as trying to select and promote the fittest organisms. Neither is the case. Evolution by natural selection is the name we've given to what happens when the living try to self-regenerate and only some of them succeed. Evolution doesn't start life. Life starts evolution. Natural selection explains how living and trying evolve, but not what living and trying are. We can't help but recognize the difference between things that try and things that don't, but scientists still can't say what trying is or how it got started at the origins of life. 
Notice how awkward this is. Science is split down the middle and we can't explain why. In the physical sciences, there's no trying. We don't say that the moon is trying to pull the tides, that protons are trying to hold electrons, that chemicals are trying to react, or that galaxies are trying to expand. But in the life and behavioral sciences, we can't help but explain what happens in terms of trying. We can't make scientific sense of living beings without acknowledging that they're trying to stay alive. Trying doesn't violate the laws of physics and chemistry. Still, it isn't addressed by those laws. It's weird. The theory of everything that physicists seek would have nothing to say about trying, indeed nothing to say about us, the living, and everything that matters most to us. So there's the mystery. What is trying and how did it start? Terence Deacon, a scientist first at Harvard, now at Berkeley, wrestled with this mystery for 25 years and came up with a solution not considered before. He imagined a universe with no living, trying beings anywhere and sought a model for how interacting chemicals could ever start trying to do self-regenerative work, work to try to keep working. To understand his solution, we have to ask first what work is. Work is what results when energy is constrained or channeled down some paths instead of others, thereby concentrating or organizing it. Think of the work a river current can do. We see the work, but we tend to ignore what's making that work possible. It's not just the water and energy, but how the energy is constrained. The river bank, which constrains the flow of water and energy, preventing it from going every which way, constraining it to flow in a powerful working current. Work is the product of constrained energy flow. Non-living things like the river channel energy into work just because they do, not because they're trying to. Machines are non-living things that we create to channel energy into functional work, work that functions for us, helping us achieve what we're trying to achieve. When creating machines, engines, computers, robots, we're like energy flow wranglers, trying to corral energy so it flows down the paths that produce work that benefits us. The machines we create aren't trying to do anything. Like everything else, machines break down over time. What breaks down is their constraints. Without us to keep reimposing their functional constraints, their functional work wouldn't continue. Machines are not self-regenerative. They don't generate their own self-protection or self-repair. We keep them protected to prevent interactions that would degenerate their constraints. We have to repair their constraints as they loosen, for example, tightening bolts. And of course, machines aren't self-reproducing. In contrast, the living are self-regenerative. Unlike machines, we prevent our own degradation. And what are the living working to self-regenerate? the constraints that enable us to channel energy into self-regenerative work. Notice the circularity. Our constraints channel energy into self-regenerative work, work to regenerate our constraints. Our bodies, many parts, constrain energy into work to protect, repair, and reproduce our body's constraints. It takes constraints to channel energy into work and work to regenerate constraints. To be alive, therefore, is to have self-regenerative constraints. Constraints that channel energy into work to maintain the constraints that channel energy into work to maintain the constraints that channel energy into work. You get the picture. It's circular. And when the circularity ends, when our constraints no longer successfully channel energy into work to regenerate our constraints, we die. To get a rough sense of the way the living regenerate their constraints, picture a mighty river running through a hydroelectric dam. The dam constrains water and energy flow to roughly one direction, yielding work that generates electricity. With time, that dam will get eroded. But what if some of the electricity generated is channeled by the dam into work that regenerates the dam? It still wouldn't be alive. It would just be a mechanical system engineered from the outside to maintain itself a little. Still, it gives you a loose impression of what life does. The dam constrains energy into work to rebuild the dam, which constrains energy into work to rebuild the dam. So the next question is how self-regenerative constraints could emerge from simple chemistry. Deacon has a solution which I'll lay out here. Self-regenerative constraint would be new constraint emerging in a non-living universe. To call it emergent doesn't explain it. 
we have to explain how new constraints emerge. And the first clue comes from studying self-organization. Non-living processes in which energy flows constrain each other, much the way that with traffic congestion, traffic flows constrain each other. The emerging constraint we find in self-organization processes is not solid and static like a riverbed or dam. It's more like the constraint you experience when you're threading your way through congested traffic and how in your threading you impose constraints on others threading their way through it. The simplest example of self-organization is whirlpool formation. Turbulent water and energy currents constrain each other, blocking paths until the only remaining path is a smooth spiral current. A whirlpool isn't self-regenerative, it's actually self-degenerative. A whirlpool in your tub drains water faster than turbulence does. No more water, no more whirlpool. Whirlpools, like all self-organizing processes, accelerate their own ending. To describe Deacon's model for the origins of trying, I'll introduce two other well-understood kinds of self-organization. The first is called autocatalysis, basically a chemical chain reaction that produces a local concentration of catalysts. Catalysts are molecules that convert other molecules called reactants into products without being altered in the process, so one catalyst molecule can convert reactant after reactant. Autocatalysis is what we call it when two or more kinds of catalysts convert reactants into more and more of each other. For example, catalyst A converts a reactant into catalyst B, which in turn converts a reactant into another catalyst A. The A's produce more B's, which produce more A's, resulting in a population explosion of catalyst A and B. How is this like a whirlpool? With both, there are new constraints that result from the molecular equivalent of traffic congestion. Given the growing crowd of catalysts, reactants are surrounded, constrained into becoming still more catalysts. As with the whirlpool, autocatalysis is self-degenerative. It brings about its own ending. With the whirlpool, the bathtub drains faster until there's no more water. With autocatalysis, reactants are converted to catalysts faster and faster until there are no more reactants. Since the catalysts are not contained in anything, they drift their separate ways, unlikely to ever get autocatalysis going again because it usually takes more than one catalyst molecule to get it started. Autocatalysis is not self-regenerative. No self-protection since autocatalysis doesn't produce anything to contain itself, and there's neither self-repair nor self-reproduction. The second example of self-organization that we'll need for Deacon's model is crystal formation, the production of organized solids. Here we'll focus on the kind of crystals we see in the production of viral shells called capsids. Viruses don't have to try to make their capsid shells. The capsids form naturally, like soap bubbles, though more sturdy. Pour soap into a beaker of water, and it naturally forms bubbles. Likewise, pour capsid molecules into a beaker of water, and they naturally form capsid shells. Like autocatalysis, capsid formation doesn't last long. Soap bubbles break when bumped. Capsid shells do too, though it takes stronger bumps. Contained in a beaker, the capsids would reform, but uncontained, as in nature, the capsid molecules get diluted the way soap molecules would in a large body of water. Capsid formation is not self-regenerative. The capsids that form are no more self-protective than soap bubbles. The shells don't self-repair, and there's nothing about capsid formation that reproduces capsid offspring. With self-organization, constraints emerge, but they aren't self-regenerative constraints. Self-organization is not a great name for the process, since there's no self trying to organize anything. So there you have it, two self-organizing processes autocatalytic chain reaction, and capsid shell formation that don't last and aren't trying to. But what if these processes were somehow combined in a synergistic way that made them self-regenerative? That's Deacon's model. Autocatalysis sometimes produces byproducts. For example, if catalyst A splits a reactant into two products, catalyst B and some other molecule C. Now, what if this byproduct molecule C happen to be a capsid molecule, the kind that form capsid shells. Autocatalysis would turn reactants into a local concentration of catalysts A and B and the byproduct capsid molecules C. As a result, 
capsid shells would form right in the midst of the chain reaction. Some shells would end up containing a few catalysts, sort of like a seed. A seed because if it breaks later in the presence of reactants, autocatalysis would likely resume, producing more A's, B's, and C's, and thus more seeds. The cycle could continue, a two-phase self-regenerative process, open chain reaction producing closed seeds that when broken regenerate the open chain reaction. Deacon calls his model an autogen, in other words, a self-regenerator. It's basically a chemical chain reaction that happens to produce seeds that if broken in the presence of reactant would restart the chain reaction, thereby producing more seeds. With the autogen, you get self-protection. It tries to regenerate the capsid shells to protect itself, and you get self-repair and self-reproduction. The open chain reaction regenerates seeds, and usually more than one, as with offspring. The autogen isn't much, but it's what we can expect from a missing link, from self-organization's emergent constraint to life's emergent self-regenerative constraint, from non-living to living, from not trying to trying. How do we know it's trying? It's easiest to see in the self-repair and self-reproduction when the autogen seed gets broken. It does constrained work to generate more seeds. That's it, trying to climb up the down escalator to keep itself going. Obviously, the autogen doesn't realize or feel like it's trying to survive, but it is trying. And where is it trying? In the synergy between the two self-organizing processes, autocatalysis and capsid formation. And what is that synergy? It's a traffic congestion constraint on what's likely to happen, a constraint that prevents the ending we see with self-organization alone. Individually, the autocatalytic chain reaction or capsid shell formation processes naturally end. Combined synergistically in the autogen, these two self-organizing processes prevent each other from ending. Given capsid formation, the autocatalytic chain reaction doesn't peter out before seeds form, seeds that make autocatalysis more likely to continue. And when capsid shells break and capsid molecules dissipate, Autocatalysis is right there replenishing the supply of capsid molecules. Lots of non-living things can look from the outside like they're trying. A river trying to reach the sea, whirlpools trying to form, RNA molecules trying to replicate, computers trying to process information. So we need a clear way to distinguish what's really trying, or we'll end up thinking that everything or nothing is trying, that rivers are alive, or that you're no more alive than a computer. The right distinction is self-regenerative constraint. The living try to self-regenerate. They try for their own sake, and that's what counts. Real trying starts with life, fragile systems that try to keep themselves going for their own sake. The living constrain energy into work to try to prevent their own ending. That trying is what Deacon argues may emerge with the autogen. Deacon has a lot more to say about the model, how it works, what it accomplishes, and what distinguishes it from alternatives. He also has a model for how autogens might evolve shells that are more likely to open in the presence of reactants, thereby increasing the likelihood that they would self-regenerate. And he has a model for how autogens might evolve a capacity to use RNA or DNA-like molecules in their self-regenerative process. When we finally understand what trying is from its origins, we'll learn a lot about our own trying. Deacon's approach has implications for how we think about evolution, information, value, free will, consciousness, mind, purpose, all of which apply to life and none of which make any sense when applied to non-living phenomena. Most fundamentally, Deacon's approach explains the difference between not trying and trying, between the cause and effect physical phenomena that we find in everything and the means to ends behavior that we find only in the living, organisms trying to stay alive and reproduce. We get a model for what life is, what you are. You are not some ghostly supernatural soul or spirit that enters your material body and drives it like a piece of heavy machinery nor are you the machinery. You're not the energy or matter that passes through you, and you're not even the work you do. You and all living beings are self-regenerative constraints, constraints that channel energy into work to regenerate the constraints. I'll be making more videos about Deacon's work, which can also be explored in his books and articles here. 
and in my new book, Neither Ghost Nor Machine, which will be out fall 2017. It's an exciting time for research into the mystery of living and trying. Thanks for watching, and subscribe here for more videos.